welcome to Dialogue. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has visited and left Taiwan. She is the most senior U.S. politician in 25 years to visit the region and in disregard of stern warnings from the Chinese side. What's the purpose of the visit? How will China respond and how will this move influence the geopolitical situation in the Asia-Pacific region? To find out, I'm joined today by Victor Gao Zhikai, Chair Professor from Sudo University, and Dr. Digbe James Ren, a political analyst and international relations scholar at the Deakin University in Australia. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qingduo. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, Victor, I will start with you. You know, how do you make of this whole saga of Pelosi's visit to the Taiwan region? Thank you very much for having me. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, as you mentioned, is the Speaker of the House of Representatives. She ranks number two uh, in terms of replacing the President of the United States next only to the Vice President of the United States. And she is generally considered as a very important Democratic Party leader. Now, her visit to Taiwan was not as a tourist. She did not go there to do some shopping as a grand old lady. She was the head of an official delegation of quite a few members of Congress of both parties. And uh, she actually not only disregarded the Chinese government's warning on many occasions, she also completely disregarded the counseling by President uh, Biden against her visit, as well as the counseling by Pentagon against her visiting Taiwan at this particular moment. So she wanted to go. I think she probably wanted to leave behind a legacy because she said she will no longer run as the speaker uh, when her term of office uh, comes to an end, even though she says she still wants to run for another term as a member of Congress. So. Uh, other than that, I think she has consistently been very anti-China, anti-Chinese Communist Party, and uh, she's uh, very ideologically driven. And uh, therefore, I think she probably wanted to build up her political legacy mm -hmm. as, for example, anti-China mm -hmm. uh, probably will be a major chapter in her historical uh, legacy left for future generations. But on the Chinese side, we see her as a very, very dangerous political activist. I would call her troublemaker in chief uh, in the world because she doesn't care about the fundamental interests of the people of Taiwan. She doesn't care uh, about the prospect and the uh, commitment for the, uh, the reunification yeah. of the two sides of the Taiwan mm -hmm. Strait because after all, we are all Chinese mm -hmm. on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. She probably wanted to pour more fuel onto the fire uh, agitating for greater independence of Taiwan and greater hostilities between Taiwan on the one hand and China's mainland on the other hand. I think this is her game plan, this is her commitment mm -hmm. and from the Chinese perspective definitely we want to uh, very much counteract against her desires, commitment, ambitions and we want to maintain and promote uh, the unification of China by peaceful means if we can and definitely achieving unification by, war, okay. by whatever means. Yeah, I mean, it, of course, you know, every country has a right to defend their sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, Jigbe, uh, so do you think, you know, Pelosi's visit now is finished? Is the world safer now? <laughs> well, I don't think so. Um, no, this is obviously going to destabilize the region even more. I think part of the uh, calculation behind uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit is to, you see, this is going to have a different effect in the Western media, in the US and in Europe, that it's going to have, say, in Asia. Uh, and this is going to build, in the Western media, this is going to build some kind of momentum for the NATO expansion and then the linking of that with AUKUS and with the Quad. And I think you might find that this is actually the strategy behind this. Uh, so not only are they putting China in a difficult position where it's going to be seen to need to respond and then that will be seen to be antagonistic, which it's not, of course, um, and then it will provide ammunition, if you like, to speed the process of NATO expansion and linking with AUKUS and with Quad. So no, it, this is going to destabilize the region further. It's not good for the economy of Taiwan. It's not good for China. It's not good for any of its neighbors in East Asia. 
then ultimately it's not good for the United States. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you know, uh, a key part at this uh, controversy is this one China principle. Uh, not long ago, about a week ago, I believe, uh, you know, while well, President Xi Jinping was speaking to President Biden, you know, he stressed that uh, the one China principle is the political foundation of China-U.S. relationship. And this one China principle, uh, you know, back in 1979, it was actually announced and emphasized by U.S. President Jimmy Carter um, in his announcement about re-establishing diplomatic ties with China. Uh, he made it clear that uh, you know, U.S. will follow this one China principle. Let's take a look. The United States of America and the People's Republic of China have agreed to recognize each other and to establish diplomatic relations as of January the 1st, 1979. The United States recognizes the government of the People's Republic of China as a sole legal government of China. Within this context, the people of the United States will maintain cultural, commercial, and other unofficial relations with the people of Taiwan. The government of the United States of America acknowledges the Chinese position that there is but one China and Taiwan is part of China. Well, Victor, as I said, you know, one China principle is critically important. It is the key uh, element here in the why there is a, contro a controversy in the first place. Okay, the U.S., uh, the President uh, Jimmy Carter made it very clear they will acknowledge you know, the Chinese one China principle. Only one China, uh, Taiwan is part of that. And also importantly, he said that the U.S. will develop an official relationship with Taiwan. Uh, you know, many viewers around the world, if they are not following uh, the Chinese history or Chinese development closely, they're not that familiar with this one China principle. They would say, hey, that's just a visit why China is so upset. Yeah, uh, this is a very important question. Allow me to mention very briefly uh, the background of this. Uh, Back in the latter part of the 1940s, there was a big civil war in China. And eventually, the nationalist government headed by Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek was defeated. They fled China's mainland to Taiwan and stayed there ever since. Now, the Communist Party of China won the civil war by rallying the Chinese people behind it. And in 1949, the People's Republic of China was established. Now, for the PRC, its mission is to unify the totality of China. So they unify everything on China's mainland, and Taiwan was the only other piece of land to be unified with. Now, the Korean War broke out, so mainland China's effort to unify Taiwan uh, was uh, uh, aborted because of the outbreak of the Great War, uh, of the Korean War. Now, for many years, China's policy was to liberate Taiwan. And for the People's Liberation Army, the China's military, their name is called China, Chinese People's Liberation Army. So liberating uh, Taiwan is a very important part of the mission of the PRA. So ever since the 1980s, China has been emphasizing peaceful reunification, meaning we want to promote peace first. And by achieving greater peace, national reunification can be achieved. Now, as far as the United States is concerned, they bet it on the nationalist government in the civil war, so they bet it on the wrong horse. So there was no diplomatic relations between PRC and the United States between 1949 all the way up to the end of 1978. Now, starting from 1971, when Kissinger came to China, 1972, when Nixon made the first uh, state visit to China, the United States expressed a strong desire to normalize its relations with the PRC. Now, this is very important. The Chinese leaders, Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, and later Deng Xiaoping, insisted that the United States need to satisfy three preconditions before the relations could be normalized. Which were the three preconditions? The United States need to withdraw its troops stationed in Taiwan. Number two is that the United States need to cancel its recognition of the Republic of China. The number three is that the United States need to abrogate its defense treaty with Taiwan. Now, the United States government dragged its feet for quite a few years from Nixon to Ford. And then when uh, President Carter became the president, uh, he recommitted to this process. So eventually, the United States government uh, satisfied all these three preconditions before China normalized the relations 
with the United States on the principle of one China. This is very important, and Taiwan is part of China, and the United States even acknowledged that the People's Republic of China is the sole legitimate representative of the totality of the Chinese people. Now, more recently, the United States wants to have the cake and eat it. They say they still recognize there is only one in China, and PRC is the sole legitimate representative. But then, on the other side, they basically say Taiwan needs to be defended. Taiwan cannot be united with China by mm -hmm. peaceful means. Mm -hmm. By non-peaceful means, that's their excuse. But the reality is they, they want to create one China and one Taiwan, or two sovereign countries on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. This is in complete violation of the one China policy, and China has zero tolerance about it. And China really wants to uh, uh, negotiate and talk with the Americans in the fullest extent that they cannot have the cake and eat it. They cannot recognize PRC on the one hand and Taiwan on the other hand. My personal view is that when the push comes to the shove, then the United States need to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Either they recognize PRC and stick to this one China policy, or they go back to before 1978 right. days. That right, is, right. they could shift to recognize Taiwan, but China will never allow them to recognize both PRC mm -hmm. on the one hand mm -hmm. and Taiwan on the other hand. They need to pick and choose. The choice is a very clear one. If they want to recognize Taiwan at the expense of the PRC, who will suffer? The American people will suffer. Or, the world course. will really be plunging into great chaos. Yes. So I think uh, uh, sanity, rationality will prevail in Washington. That's right. Uh, Digby, I think, uh, you know, uh, Victor uh, gave a, uh, a present a very, uh, you know, a brief and a clear history of this Taiwan question, you know, why there is a Taiwan question, why China is so upset about the U.S. Uh, Pelosi's visit, because that's uh, official relationship, senior, most senior officials in 25 years. That's uh, like a de facto recognition of independence or support of Taiwan independence, of course, unacceptable for the Chinese side. But it's, uh, you know, the Chinese response is, for me, I see, it's not only to the to the Pelosi's visit, but also you can see, you know, the, the Chinese word is like hollowing out of this one China principle or undoing this one China uh, commitment from the Washington. Even Biden, you know, himself in 2021 uh, accepted an envoy from Taiwan. That's the first time since 1978, not to mention five rounds of uh, arms sale to Taiwan to support the Taiwan independence. Well, <clears throat> this is obviously going to set another precedent. And after this, we might see a whole slew of uh, visits to the island from uh, people from uh, Europe, uh, leaders from Europe, from NATO countries, of course, from the United Kingdom and other countries. Um, and of course, the, the thing is that there has to be a very careful balance in the American uh, public diplomacy or public discourse so that they need to be seen as the most importantly as the peacemaker right so that's that the whole thing relies on the idea that they are you know free and open and it's defending liberty and so forth and democracy but of course this is not what is actually happening so that's a very fine line and so then there's you know with the separation there was this uh, discussion about separation of powers in the United States and so but the speaker of the house represents the government of the United States so this clearly contravenes uh, the arrangements that were set. And I think they're going to, what's going to happen is the United States is now going, they're going to basically be able to get, you know, anything less than war is kind of they can get away with it. And so they go, that's the thinking that they're going to have. And in the meantime, they're going to be building, you know, a base, a public opinion base to be able to increase the pressure and the military alliance structures in the Indo-Pacific. This is a much larger strategy. It's a long-term strategy. The idea here is to weaken China as much as possible, to slow down its economic growth, and to put it in a position where it is unable to resist other than through force, which is what you know, we want to all avoid, mm -hmm. uh, getting to that situation. But I think it's, um, it's going to be a very, very difficult task, and it's going to take enormous uh, finesse in Chinese diplomacy and uh, using all of its... Uh, uh, contacts, diplomatic contacts around the world to offset what what the Americans have set in, on course. That being said, I think that the Americans are in a hurry because of the November elections and also because of the perilous state of their economy and also uh, Europe's economy. Uh, so there's uh, a lot can change between now and November. 
Mm -hmm. A lot can change. But speak of that, you know, the U.S. government uh, over there, Victor, uh, you know, there's a, it gave you this impression that, uh, you know, Pelosi's visit was somehow, uh, U.S. government would say that's her own decision. Uh, at the very beginning, as you said, the U.S. government is against the idea, the military is against the idea, but, you know, she insists on uh, going to Taiwan. But later on, the U.S. government says, oh, um, basically they uh, stood behind uh, her uh, visit over there. Uh, but uh, anyway, they give you the impression of this confusion or confu uh, incoherent uh, strategy or policy making in Washington, or even a scheme between Biden and, uh, and Pelosi. You know, they are leaders of the Democratic Party. That somehow Biden, at the present, uh, you know, is not able to ring in uh, a rogue uh, like a Congress person mm -hmm. here. Well, I think uh, when uh, these different leaders in the United States, when the government versus Congress versus the Pentagon uh, speak different things, we need to pause and try to pierce through the veil mm -hmm. to see what exactly uh, they are up to. I think it is not denied that the United States over the past few years increasingly view China as an enemy. Now, China does not want to be an enemy of the United States, and the Chinese people want to be friends with the American people. But the United States is really worried about the ever-increasing size of the Chinese economy. They want to see that China will not grow that fast and will not grow that big to take away the hegemony position from the United States. From the Chinese perspective, we firmly believe that the right to economic development is uh, part of the Chinese people's right, and no country has any right to take away China's right to development. And if anyone wants to deprive the development right from the Chinese people, that probably will be the largest crime against humanity. And China may be bigger or smaller eventually, etc., but that's a very natural cause of economic development. Even if China is larger than the United States, China has no desire to replace the United States as the largest hegemon in the world. Philosophically, China sees no fun of becoming the hegemon or the top dog in the world. So I think China and the United States still need to compare notes and come up with a more balanced view of each other. But if the United States views China as an enemy, then do you know what they will do? They will hold on to Taiwan as a piece of asset for the United States because they want to hold on to Taiwan, probably promoting its independence and using Taiwan as a pawn to slow down China's economic development. And in time of war, Taiwan will be, as MacArthur and other US leaders before said, the unsinkable aircraft carrier against China. Mm -hmm. So this is what the United States is up to. We need to let them know that we understand their true motivation. We will not tolerate that, and we will defend the One China policy as much as we can, and Taiwan will never be separated from China. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now we have uh, Dr. Clifford uh, uh, Kurakov, a former senior professional staff member of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, Clifford, thank you for joining us. Now, you know, Pelosi's visit, uh, many people say um, maybe she's thinking about her uh, political legacy as uh, she's out on the way out of the uh, Speaker's office, probably starting January in January. Uh, and also, people say that's a you know, political stand in Taiwan, nothing substantial except for breaking this one China principle over there. Uh, some others say, you know, she's probably trying to create some distraction about uh, the scandal uh, related to her and her husband about, uh, you know, uh, investment in the stocks, in cheap stocks. What do you make? Well, I think um, the visit of uh, Speaker Pelosi to China is... Um, orchestrated by uh, the White House or with the approval of the White House. So it's not her initiative alone. She's on an official aircraft, and uh, she's not on a private aircraft. She's on an official aircraft. And um, the Secretary of State has endorsed her visit strongly, and the President of the United States has uh, uh, endorsed it uh, indirectly, we can say. So, and the President of the United States, of course, could have uh, not permitted her to use an official aircraft. And the President of the United States, uh, also a Democratic Party leader, could have told Ms. Pelosi, a Democrat, that uh, this is not wise in terms of U.S.-China relationship. But Mrs. Pelosi is, uh, you know, egotistical, as most 
politicians are, and uh, she won't be speaker in November because it appears that the Republicans will win at least the House, possibly the Senate also. So politically, this is the time for her to take a big trip, uh, go on out to Asia or wherever. She could have gone to Europe or Africa or somewhere else, but she decided to go out to Asia. So it's part of her so-called political legacy, which is actually a disaster. It's sort of 180 degrees opposite uh, Henry Kissinger in 1972 opening, when uh, the whole American people were uh, excited and happy about the opening to China and the prospect for better relations. Right now, we're at 180 degrees opposite, and uh, the Pelosi visit, I think, symbolizes the 180 degrees opposite of the original Kissinger policy to open up to China and have reasonable relations, and uh, President Carter uh, followed up on that, and uh, so it was bipartisan in the old days to have good relations with China, and Russia, too, for that matter. Today in Washington, the atmosphere is 180 degrees opposite. A hundred senators just voted against Uh, Russia are calling it a state sponsor of terrorism. It's 100 out of 100. And that similar uh, hysteria applies to China. Washington is hysterical about China and sees it as a threat. And uh, the politicians there are uh, delusional in thinking that they can impose a U.S. hegemony. Mm -hmm. Uh, The U.S. should adjust to other powers. Yes. Uh, And, uh, And... pursue a peaceful policy. Right. Well, let's take a look. Uh, you know, no wonder you know, people would call uh, Pelosi's visit as a provocative, or people would say unnecessary and provocative. Uh, there's, you know, there are still warnings from the Chinese government, but let's take a look at the Chinese ambassador to the U.S., Qin Gang. Uh, he gave an interview to John King of CNN, Inside Politics, expressing China's a strong position on the U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Let's take a look. Let me say this. 25 years ago, uh, Speaker Gingrich visited Taiwan. It was completely wrong. The Chinese side was firmly opposed to it from the start. The U.S. side should draw lessons from it instead of making repeat mistakes. And one mistake cannot justify the following mistakes in the same nature. Well, people should not confuse uh, the question of Taiwan with uh, the uh, Ukrainian conflict. And on the question of Taiwan, it concerns China's core interest. And some people here in the United States, on the the issue of Ukraine, they emphasized uh, national sovereignty and territorial integrity. But why? They do whatever they want to damage China's core core interest, infringe China's national sovereignty, territorial integrity. This is a play of a double standards. So we firmly reject that. And China has every right to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. We are fully justified to do what we must. The current situation is created purely by the U.S. side. So, of course, it has to bear the responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Clifford, obviously, there's a need, you know, from the Chinese point of view, you have to, uh, you know, respond firmly. Um, so far, there's a measured response, but also firm, because uh, obviously, that could be, uh, a, you know, a precedent being set by Pelosi. Uh, there will be a lot of, uh, you know, many more troubles probably on the way uh, for Western officials. They would say, oh, we want to develop a relationship with Taiwan. So that created a lot of trouble uh, against the One China principle. Clifford. Yes, uh, the, yes. The, it would be uh, simplest for the White House to explain to the American people that Taiwan is to China as Hawaii is to the United States. That is to say, Taiwan is an integral part of China. That has been stated in the three communiques and in other language over the years, diplomatic language by the U.S. side. However, uh, in recent years, there's a trend to support the DPP and uh, in Taiwan, that political party, and to support what uh, is perceivable as uh, independence, let's say, or separatism of Taiwan. In Washington, D.C. today, Taiwan is spoken of as a separate country. Uh, The politicians are under the delusion that it's a 
a separate country somehow legally. So the the issue of, of Taiwan, in one sense, is simple to explain. It's just like Hawaii to the United States. On the other hand, the United States has had a policy of ambiguity uh, to try to... <laughs> Uh, uh, pretend uh, that uh, it doesn't support Taiwan independence, but now there are calls for a move to strategic clarity, um, and this clarity idea means let's fully support in the open, without double talk, uh, Taiwan independence. And I think the Pelosi visit is certainly symbolic of this uh, st- clarity idea that mm-hmm. uh, Taiwan is an independent country. Right, uh, Victor. Uh, obviously, even people in Taiwan, the you know, majority of them, obviously, they are against the visit because they are fully aware that Pelosi is not bringing them with security and peace. Instead, probably potential dangers. As we mentioned, that there are people in the United States who want to promote Taiwanese independence. And uh, whether they continue to follow strategic ambiguity or strategic clarity, that's another thing. However, allow me to put it for the record here tonight that even if the United States supports Taiwanese independence, Taiwan will not be an independent country. Why? Because the 1.4 billion Chinese people will never allow that. It's a pipe dream. It is an unrealistic political gamble. It will wreck the fortune of the United States if they want to become an enemy of China. How can anyone in Washington really believe that by promoting Taiwanese independence, Taiwanese independence will be a reality. It will never be a reality. Taiwan is just by the Chinese coastline, and you have 1.4 billion Chinese people united. You have the Chinese People's Liberation Army, whose mission is to liberate the totality of China, including Taiwan. Come on, it's a dream. It's a pipe dream. It's a fantasy. Be realistic. The United States, after all, is a country. You need to be a realistic country in the world of today rather than indulging in fantasy. Mm-hmm. U.S. support for Taiwanese independence will not make Taiwan a separate, independent, sovereign country, period. Mm-hmm. Well, Digby, obviously, I mean, China will uh, fight in a firm way to defend the territorial integrity. There's no way for the U.S. somehow to... Uh, instigate Taiwan independence, and they will get away with that. Uh, and and I think you know the policy toward China, toward Taiwan here, is is like a recipe for disaster, for disaster, disastrous situation for this entire region. Well, look, it is a recipe for disaster. But I think what the United States is really trying to do here is to get the declaration of uh, of independence made for Taiwan, and then they'll recognize Taiwan as an independent country, and they'll try and. Con- coerce or, you know, um, get all of their allies to do the same thing. And they will do everything short of actual war with China. But they have to understand, and as Victor has just said, that the PLA and China is resolute on this. That's a red line. And they will do everything they can to to maintain um, the unification with Taiwan. Um, And I think the Americans at this point uh, uh, really just see... They really just see increased militarization in Europe towards Russia and in the Indo-Pacific towards China as their as their, their primary strategy, um, and uh, they're going to continue down that line. And I think that yes, we're getting very very close to uh, a point where yes, red lines will be crossed. Um, and I think uh, that uh, we, you know it's going to come down to November really, and uh, if Biden and the Democrats the Democrats Uh, lose some power in the House, that will be to the advantage of China and to Taiwan as well. And um, this is going to take a long time to settle. And it's going to be very, very difficult. Tensions are going to be high for quite a long time, I think. Yeah, with that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thank you for being with us. See you next time.